hopefully for you as well. Okay. So sometimes I say to myself, Jim, it's too much information. I could preach a real easy sermon and get everybody all fired up, and that's good. That's good. There are, there's a place for that. There certainly is. Um, but there's also time that you need to understand things that's going on. Um, it came home to me this weekend, the majority of the world has no clue what's happening. They see Israel and the, the drones that went against Israel with Iran, and Israel shot down like 99% of them. And they see that going on, and they have no clue what's going on in the world around us. And my, I see the world from a different set of lenses. I look at the world from a spiritual standpoint. Because there is a spiritual war going on. You know, Jesus, in Luke chapter 21, if you want to turn your Bibles, you can. But uh, there, Jesus said, watch out that you're not deceived. When he's talking about the end times, he told his disciples, don't be deceived. We're going to talk about the deception that is starting and coming in the next few weeks. But the reason you should understand Bible prophecy is so you won't be deceived. Because deception is coming. And it's already starting. You say, how do I avoid being deceived? I told you this last week, but... The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. The way you avoid from being deceived is you walk with God, and you learn about God, and and, and you listen to Him, spend time in prayer, read His Word, absorb His Word. If you don't know the Word of God, you're going to be deceived, and many people are, and many people will be. And so I want to challenge you. The reason I spend so much time, I'm going to spend a little few weeks on this passage, and we're going to look at little things in this passage that are so important. I don't want you to be deceived. I want you to know what's going on around you. Does anybody in here play chess? Oh, Quentin plays chess. It's been a long time. Anybody heard of this game called chess? There are grand chess masters, there are tournaments all over the world. If you were to go to parks in Russia right now or New York City, you would see people playing chess. If you've played chess, the simple thing is the goal is to capture the opponent's king. That is the goal. And it, there are movies about this game, books about this game. It is a highly, highly complicated game. You can be. You really have to think to play chess, and uh, it's a good mental game. Well, I submit to you that right now there is a game of cosmic chess being played. It's a game between God and Satan, and there is a chess game being played on the world stage, and we are the pawns. We've been in the middle of the history of this. And Satan makes a move and God makes a move. And Satan makes a move and God makes a move. Now we know how it's going to end. Because Satan can't beat God at this game. God knows all. Satan does not. But at the same time, we're in the middle of the game. So what I want to do today and for the next few weeks is pull the curtain back and let you peer in and see what's going on in the game. So we're going to go into the spiritual side, but at the same time we're talking about what's happening physically, okay? I know I'm going to give you a lot of things this morning. Don't worry about all the data. I'm just doing it to show you what, how the game is moving, but there's some things you do need to re- remember this morning. When I told you last week, when you study Bible prophecy, one thing you want to do is look for location clues. Where is this happening Iran, by the way, that just attacked Israel and all that stuff, is Persia in the Bible. And when you read Bible prophecy, Persia is going to attack Israel in the last days. They are part of a coalition. We are seeing it form right now in the Middle East. I don't know where this is going to go, but we're setting the stage each time. And if you go to Luke 21, 
where we've been at, Jesus tells us a specific city. Luke chapter 21, verse 20. And he tells his disciples, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then recognize that its desolation has come near. And those in Judea, so now we're not just Jerusalem, that whole, that whole area, must flee to the mountains. Those inside the city, Jerusalem, must leave it. And those who are in the country outside of Jerusalem must leave it. Because those are the days of vengeance to fulfill all things that are written. Woe to pregnant women and nursing mothers in those days, for there will be great distress in the land, wrath against this people. Who's he talking to? The Jews. And he says, they, this is the Jews, will be killed by the sword and be led captive into all the nations. And Jerusalem will be trampled by the Gentiles until the time of the end are fulfilled. So Jesus gave a prophecy. He said, this city, Jerusalem, is going to be surrounded by armies and it's going to be destroyed. And if you know history, that happened about 30, 40 years later when Rome marched against Jerusalem. And they surrounded the city and they destroyed the temple, they destroyed the city. And only about 1.1 million Jews were killed, according to historian Josephus. And so this prophecy did come true. But remember, in the Bible, many times a near prophecy is also going to be repeated again in the future. And there's going to be a future coming. I don't know when, but I think it's closer than further away. When Jerusalem will be surrounded once again by the armies of the world. And there will be one more final attack to destroy Jerusalem. Now the question is, what's so special about Jerusalem? Right? What makes Jerusalem any different than Indianapolis? Who who cares what goes on in Jerusalem? Why, Why Jerusalem? What is so interesting? And then, how does this apply to my life, really? I want to talk to you this morning about Jerusalem. And the reason I I want to do this is I want you to understand the history of Jerusalem and why this city is a unique city in all the world. There's no other city like it. And I want you to see God's hand in Jerusalem. And I also, the reason I want to teach this to you is when you watch the news, you kind of understand what's going on. There's a spiritual dimension to all this. It's not just about armies attacking armies. So we're going to jump back into our cosmic chest for just a second. And I want to talk to you for a few minutes about before Jerusalem ever happened. I'm going to give you some history this morning. You know why I do that? Because if you don't know history, you're, failed, you're doomed to repeat it in the future. You need to understand what happened in Jerusalem. Now I'm going to share with you a few things as we start off. Because the Bible doesn't give us a lot of information before Uh, in the early years of this world. But let me give you what makes sense in my mind. Before God created us, before He created the world, He created angels. I think most of us would agree with that. Angels were created before humanity. And if you read Psalm 82, Job chapter 1, Ezekiel 28, Isaiah 14... I believe that those passages teach us that God has a divine counsel. Now, God doesn't need people to tell him what to do, but he has this divine counsel. Read Psalm 82. I believe God has this divine counsel, and I believe that Satan was originally part of it. We know he was an angel around the throne of God, and I believe Satan was originally a part of this divine counsel. And so... God creates the angels, and then he creates the world, the universe. All right? Now, one thing we know about angels, they are spiritual beings, right? They operate in a different dimension than we do. There could be angels in this room right now. We just can't see them with our physical eyes. In fact, I hope there are (laughs) angels in this room. hope one's standing next to me. We just can't see them. But we know in Scripture that sometimes angels can actually take on human form, right? There's all sorts of stories of angels, and I don't think there's any reason why they couldn't take on animal form if they so desired. 
You see, I think Satan took on the form of a serpent and came into the garden. And I think that he would occasionally go into the garden and talk to Adam and Eve. You go, you read Genesis, it's like, why wasn't Eve like, ah, a talking snake? To her, it was just normal. He, he could talk. And I think what happened, now this is just a little bit of my view, you may disagree, but I think Satan, who was part of God's divine counsel, said, wow, God has created this universe and he's created this new group of people different than us. And I want to be in charge of them. I want to be God to the world. And when Satan did that, pride entered his heart and he fell. And God said, you're not in the divine council anymore. You're out. Now, in my mind, that makes sense is Satan, after being kicked out and after sin entered into his heart and several angels followed him, Satan goes back into the Garden of Eden. But this time, he doesn't go in there just to talk to Eve. He goes in there to deceive Eve because he wants the humans to follow him. And so he deceives Eve, tempts her, and her and Adam sin. And so Satan, I forgot, I was going to ask my dad if we could bring a chessboard, but Satan makes his move, and he takes the pawn. I got him. I've corrupted humanity. And if you know the story of Genesis, God comes to the garden, and he pronounces judgment. Genesis 3.15, God says this. I'm going to send a person, a man. We know that. It says he's going to be a male who will be born of the seed of woman. And he's going to crush your head, Satan. You're going to strike his heel, but he's going to crush your head. Now remember, Satan is not God. He doesn't know everything. So all he knows is there is a man coming. So Satan's next move on the chessboard is I'm going to corrupt humanity. So I can corrupt whoever's coming. And I believe Genesis 6, 1 through 4 talks about the sons of God cohabiting with the daughters of men. And I believe very clearly, and, if there, and I've done whole series lessons on this, that there were fallen angels that came to the earth and cohabited with women. And they created the Nephilim. When you see these ancient alien stories about these huge... Structures like, we don't know how this was built. They were giants. The Nephilim were giants. They were huge, powerful people. And so Satan thought, I'm going to corrupt all humanity and stop whoever's coming. But God had a move on the chessboard. Adam and Eve's third son was named Seth. And the Bible says at that point, people began to call on the name of the Lord. And Seth's descendants ended up with a guy named Noah. And, of course, God said, I'm going to use you. And he, he, Noah found grace in the eyes of God. And, of course, you know the story. So God said, okay, my next move is I'm just going to wipe humanity off the table. I'm going to leave Noah and his wife and his sons and their wives. They're going to get in the boat. I'm going to wipe the rest of humanity off the table. And so God makes that power move. Yet, the Bible tells us that the Nephilim existed before the flood and after the flood, Genesis 6, 1 through 4. The question is, how did they exist after the flood if they were all killed? Well, if you know the story, Noah gets drunk, his son Ham comes in, Ham gazes on his father, he tells his brothers, his brothers walk in backwards out of respect and they cover their father. And when Noah wakes up, he curses not Ham, but his son, Canaan. Why does he curse Canaan? I believe that Noah recognized in his grandson Nephilim characteristics. See, we don't know anything about their wives. And it's very possible, and it seems that Ham was the least religious of any of the brothers, that probably Ham married a woman who had Nephilim in her. And it had been passed down through Canaan. And so I believe that's why Noah cursed Canaan. Now, again, I want to stop the tape for just a second and rewind it. All right? Y'all following me? Are you following me in the story? All right. 
Now, what I'm going to say next, some people are not going to agree with, and that's fine. I'll fix you later. No. Let me ask you, is the Bible a science textbook? No. No, it's not a science book. Is the Bible a history book? No, it has history in it, but it's not a history book. The Bible is a theological book. It is a book about God revealing himself to humanity. The Bible's about God, right? It's about God interacting with humanity. Now, there have been all sorts of battles fought over the creation of the world. Was it in six literal days? Was it in ages and all that? A few years ago, I read a book by a Southern Baptist professor, he's now deceased, called Genesis Unbound. And he argued that Genesis 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, is a statement that God created everything. And then in Genesis 1, verse 2, and the first day God said, you know, all those things. From Genesis 1, 2 to chapter 2, 4 is not about God creating the world. It's about God preparing the promised land. That in seven days, God was preparing. It's really talking about his preparation of the land. Now, I don't have time to get into all the stuff. You can read his book. He was an Old Testament Hebrew professor. He goes into all the languages. But I thought that makes sense. Because the books of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers, if you read them, are constantly talking about the land. The promised land. The land. And I thought that makes sense. It is really about God preparing the land for his people. So here's what I would argue. Satan knew something was special about that area. Right? Satan knew that. I mean, years later, when the Israelites came on the scene before they entered the promised land in Deuteronomy... God said, the land you are entering to possess is a land of mountains and valleys watered by rain from the sky. It is the land the Lord God, your, listen to this, it is the land your Lord God cares for. He is always watching over it from the beginning to the end of the year. Noah says, God cares for this land. He has his eye on this land. Now, just think about this. Satan, I believe, knew that there was something special about that land. He didn't know exactly what was going to happen. He tried to corrupt humanity, and God saved Noah and his family. But apparently, the corruption continued through Ham's line, and Noah cursed Canaan. And so if you were Satan, what would you do? What would be your next move? I'm going to try and move all of Canaan's descendants over into that land. Because it's very interesting, I I wish I had my other TV, we're having some problems, but if you look at the land where the Jews took, if you can see it in purple, those are all of Canaan's descendants. They all went to that area of the world, the land. I think think Satan was trying to block God. I'm going to do everything I can to keep you from going, I know, I don't know everything, But I think there's something special about that area. Because I would argue, by the way, I know you all think I'm crazy, the Garden of Eden was in Jerusalem. I would argue it was in Jerusalem area originally. And so Satan says, I'm going to send all Canaan's descendants over there. And that's where they go. They inhabit that whole area. Now, again, uh, the, the descendants of Canaan, when they went there, they started a city... And the city was called Jebus. All right? And the people that lived in it were called the Jebusites. That city would later be called Jerusalem. Now, are y'all still awake? Y'all still following me? All right? I hope so. I know y'all may be just shaking your head and you're thinking, what's for lunch? I don't know. But just follow me just for a second. All right? So if you know the story, God takes Abraham, pulls him out right in the middle of Satan's territory. And says, I'm going to start a new race of people through you. And Abraham and his wife, they have two sons. And, and the line goes through Isaac. And then Isaac marries, uh, uh, um, my brain's thinking. They, he has two sons. And the line continues to go through Jacob. 
And then Jacob has 12 sons, and you have the, those are the 12 tribes of Israel. And then you know, Satan says, okay, I'm going to make a move. I'm going to enslave those people in Egypt. And so the Jews get enslaved in Egypt. And then God's like, okay, I want to make a move. And he sends in Moses. And Moses says, let my people go. And, and, you know, and Pharaoh says, no. And Moses says, let my people go. And God's like, okay, I want to throw all sorts of plagues on you. And finally, Pharaoh says, okay, they can go. And so the Israelites get to go. And, and, and then, if you know the story, Moses dies. And then Joshua comes on the scene. And Joshua goes into the promised land. And they start conquering all the cities in the promised land except one they can't conquer. You know what city it was? Jebus. They could not defeat the people of Jebus. And, and, and so eventually the judges rule over Israel, and then the Israel has their first king, his name's Saul. Saul can't defeat Jebus, so he sets up his, his um, throne there in Gibeah. And then David comes along. David originally rules in Hebron, and then David says, enough. And two of David's men, his mighty warriors, they go through a water shaft in Jebus. And they get into the city because the king of Jebus had been taunting David. Say, you can't get us. Nobody's ever defeated us. And so two of David's warriors, they go through a water shaft. I don't know. They, they, I guess they held their breath and just swam through that water shaft through and got into Jerusalem, now called Jerusalem. And they opened the gates and then David's army came in and David took the city of Jebus and now they know it as Jerusalem. Got it. Now the Jews have Jerusalem. All right. Now y'all know what this is? Dome of the Rock. If you see a picture of Jerusalem on TV, you will see this structure. It is built on the Temple Mount. All right. Obviously, we know the name is because it has a dome. But what is the rock? Well, this city... Is built, this, this structure is built over this rock. Now, it is believed, the Jews believe, you remember the story when Abraham sacrificed or took Isaac to sacrifice him? The Jews believe it was right here that Isaac was placed on that rock. Now, of course, God doesn't call for human sacrifice. It was a test of Abraham's faith. And, of course, he didn't actually sacrifice Isaac because God delivered a ram. Okay? When David... So fast forward many years later. When David takes Jerusalem, there is the, this area, this rock, was used as what was called a threshing floor. And I won't get into what all that means, threshing. But he goes up to the guy who owns this. And David says, hey... You know, I want to buy this. And the guy says, no. And David's like, I'm not going to, you know, I'm going to pay for it. And so David purchases this and the area, which is called the Temple Mount. Okay? But if you know the story, God wouldn't let David build the temple. So David got all the materials together. And then David's son Solomon came on the scene. And Solomon built the temple. And according to... To Jewish tradition, this rock was the floor of the Holy of Holies in the temple. This was the floor of the Holy of Holies in the temple. Now you say, okay, Jim, thanks for the history lesson. What's going on? Folks, Jerusalem to the Jews contains the holiest place on earth. For the Jews... Right there at the Temple Mount is the holiest place on the earth. And that's why they want Jerusalem. So let me give you, again, uh, here's a, 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 a rendering of what Solomon's temple may have looked like. Now let me, get, let me just go through the timeline. I know you're not going to remember all this. I just want you to understand what's going on. In, in 930 B.C., Israel split into two parts. In 722, the Assyrians took the top part, Israel, the top ten tribes. And then in 586, the Babylonians came in. They took the last half and they destroyed the temple in 586. Then the Babylonians were conquered by the Medo-Persians. And in 539, they let the Jews return. Only a small group returned. 
In 516, the Jews started rebuilding their temple. So now it was going to be the second temple. And in the mid-400s, Nehemiah came and he helped rebuild the walls around Jerusalem. Then the Greeks came and they took over. They defeated the uh, Medo-Persians. And here was a big thing. In 167 B.C., a Greek king of the Seleucid Empire named Antiochus Epiphanes IV demanded that the Jews worship the Greek gods. He went into the temple and he set up a statue of Zeus and he sacrificed a pig on the altar. Many people see the Antiochus Epiphanes as the prototype of the Antichrist. And the Jews revolted. And the, there was a priestly family named the uh, Hasmoneans, and they rose up, the Maccabeans, and there was the Maccabean revolt. And the Jews took Jerusalem back from the Greeks. And they said, you're not going to do this. And they rose up, and they took Jerusalem back from the Greeks. Has anybody ever heard of Hanukkah? Anybody heard of Hanukkah? Right? You know, that's what they lied at Hanukkah time. By the way, the, the Jewish menorah has seven candles. This has nine and it's to, re, it's to remember the time the Jews took Jerusalem back from the Greeks. And that's what Hanukkah is about. And so the Jews actually had control of Jerusalem until 63 B.C. when the Romans marched into town and the Romans under Pompey took Jerusalem back. And Herod the Great went on the throne, came on the throne in about 20 B.C. He started taking the temple and expanding it. And making it this incredible, beautiful structure. Luke 21. That's the same temple that was standing in Jesus' day. As some of them were talking about the temple, how it was adorned with precious stones and gifts decorated to God. The temple was a magnificent structure in Jesus' day. Herod the Great had made it huge. It was incredible. And then, Jesus, here's a picture of what the temple complex looked like originally. But then Jesus said, hey, you see these stones? They're going to be torn down. Not one stone is going to be left on another. The days will come when not st one stone will be left on another that has not been thrown down. And if you know the history a little bit, a, somewhere between 30 and 33, we're not going to get into a debate this morning, Jesus is crucified and resurrected. And then what Jesus said would happen, happened. AD 70, the temple is destroyed. And many of the Jews are killed, not all, but many are killed. Now, okay, Jim, why is Jerusalem so important? Because of the Jews, it contains the most holiest site in the world. Why about Christians? Let me give you another reason why Jerusalem is important. For Christians, Jerusalem is an important part of Jesus' ministry. If you look at Jesus, he healed people in Jerusalem. It, it, was in, it was in Jerusalem that Jesus was dedicated as a baby. It was in Jerusalem that Jesus went to the temple as a 12-year-old. It was in Jerusalem that Jesus rode into the donkey into the area. It was in Jerusalem that Jesus healed the man at the pool of Shalom. It, it was in, the, in Jerusalem that Jesus out, he was crucified and he was resurrected. And so to Christians... Christians say, wow, Jerusalem's important because that's where Jesus did a big chunk of his ministry. And, and that's where he was died and rose again. Now, back to our story. A few years later, Emperor Hadrian came along and he renamed Jerusalem. Aelina Capitolina, as I told you, it was named after the Roman gods. The Jews got mad about it, they revolted. And they lost, and they were kicked out of Jerusalem. It was called the Bar Kokhba Rebellion. And Hadrian, because he hated the Jews so much, renamed it Palestina, which is where we get the name Palestine, because he wanted to erase all memory of the Jews. Now, <clears throat> with the Jews kicked out, Christianity was growing, Right? And in 322, the emperor, the Roman emperor, Constantine, became a Christian, or he said he did. And he said, hey, it's okay to worship God. And so the, the Christians were like, hey, and they started building churches in Rome. The Christians, because before Christians were like in huddled in rooms and things like that, because it was illegal. 
And now they're like building things. And guess what the Christians wanted to do? Let's go to Jerusalem. And so the Christians start building buildings in Jerusalem too. And you may know this. This right here is one of the buildings. It's called the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. So right in the 4th century, Christians built this church. It's supposedly where uh, Jesus was believed to have been crucified and buried. And then Christians built uh, the Dormitorian Abbey there on Mount Zion as well. That's where they believe that Mary, the mother of Jesus, died. And so Christians started building all sorts of buildings in Jerusalem because the Christians, that's us, were saying this is a sacred place. This is a special city. You know, Jesus said in Luke 21 that Jerusalem be trampled on by the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles are fulfilled. We're Gentiles. The Jews were not, for the most part, barred from living in Jerusalem. And now the Christians were there. And, and other peoples. So that was what's going on. Remember our cosmic chess illustration here? I'm trying to get you to see the chess pieces. It's like Satan makes a move, God makes a move. Satan makes a move, God makes a move. Remember I told you where Map's descendants went? They all went in that area where Israel is today in Jerusalem. Now, let's talk about this some more. I wish I had my little TV down here. I don't know if you can see it. But right over here on the other side of the Red Sea, you'll see a, a purple one. It's called Dedan. I, you probably can't read it back there. But some of Map's Ham's descendants went over to Dedan. Let me ask you a question. Does anybody ever heard of Mecca? Anybody heard of Mecca? You know where Mecca is located? In that same region where the Dedanites went, Ham's descendants. So why is Jerusalem important? Well, not only is the Jews say it contains the holiest place on the earth, and not only do the Christians say it is a holy city, that's where Jesus did his miracles, especially the Temple Mount is very sacred. Then you had Dedan, and over on that side of the world, Satan makes a move, and we now have Islam. In the 600s. So Muslims consider Jerusalem a sacred city. Real quickly, I won't go through their history. But in the 600s, Muslims captured Jerusalem. And that's when they built the Dome of the Rock. And that's when they built the al Aska Mosque. Just like Christians, the Muslims now took control of Jerusalem. And they started building buildings. And they built that Dome of the Rock over that rock there. Because according to Muslims... Abraham didn't sacrifice Isaac, it was Ishmael he tried to sacrifice. And so they consider that a sacred spot as well. Now there, in Islam there are three sacred cities, Mecca, Medina, and Jerusalem. And so when they took control, they built the Dome with the Rock, and they built the al Aska Mosque, as well as other structures in Jerusalem. So it seemed like Satan moved in and took a piece. Now he's got control of Jerusalem. Now if you know the timeline, and I'm sure most of us probably don't know this off the top of our heads, but the Christians got mad and they came and said, no, we're going to take Jerusalem back. And you had the Crusades. And then the Ottoman Empire arose. It was a, it's a Muslim empire. And they controlled Jerusalem all the way up until 1917 when the British took control of Jerusalem. And during the late 1800s and early 1900s, the European Jews started coming back into Jerusalem. They started allowing them to come back in. And the Jewish population once again began to grow in Jerusalem. And you know what happened on this day, don't you? Here's another piece of cosmic chess. God made his move. On May 14, 1948, Israel became a nation. The prophet Isaiah saw this, I believe, many years ago before. He said, who has heard of such a thing? Who has seen such a thing? Can a land be born in one day or a nation delivered in an instant? And it happened. He was like, how can this happen? Can this really happen? Yes. On May 14, 1948, Israel was founded. By the way, recently on, uh, there was an interview on the 100th day of the Hamas war there, the Gaza war. And one of the Hamas leaders said that the reason they invaded and killed the Jews was because of the red cows. If you know what's going on in Jerusalem, they now have red heifers 
in Jerusalem. For the first time in 2,000 years, there are three red heifers. And if you, if you know what's going on, the Jews have all the plans for their temple. They have their priesthood identified. They have all the articles for their temple. They want to build their temple. Of course, that's going to be a problem because the, the Muslims have the Temple Mount. And again, if you go back to Numbers 19, the Jews believe that in order to purify the priest and the temple, they have to have the ashes of a red heifer. I don't know if it's going to happen, but the rumor is that during Passover, which is starting next week, the 21st, the 22nd, I believe, through the 30th, the Jews are going to sacrifice those red heifers. We don't know for certain, but that's the rumor right now. And they've, there's, there's also been a platform supposedly built on the Mount of Olives. I've seen pictures of it. And Hamas, one of the Hamas leaders said, one of the reasons we invaded was for the red cows. Because to Hamas, to the Muslims, if the Jews sacrifice those cows and get those ashes, that's another step closer to them getting that temple. And we don't want them to have that temple. And he said that's one of the reasons they invaded and slaughtered the Jews. One last reason. So now you have three religions. Jews, the most important site. Christians, important site. Muslims, important site. There's no other nation in the world like this. And two of the largest religions of the world, Christianity and Islam. They're fighting for the Israel, for Jerusalem. And let me give you one last reason. Jerusalem is a political obstacle for a two-state solution. The prophet Zechariah said this, Look, I will make Jerusalem a cup that causes staggering for the peoples who surround the city. The siege against Jerusalem will also involve Judah. On that day I will make Jerusalem a heavy stone for all the peoples. All who try to lift it will injure themselves severely when the nations of the earth gather against it. Zechariah is telling about a day when the nations of the earth will once again surround Jerusalem. And he, he calls Jerusalem a cup of staggering, a, a block that can't be moved. And that's where we're at politically. If you know the story, when, the, when Israel started, they had control of the west part of Jerusalem, but not the east part. And in 1967, three Arab nations came against Israel. Won't get into all that. Israel beat them in six days. It was a six-day war. And Israel took control of the east of Jerusalem. If I were to ask you today, what is the capital of Washington, uh, of the United States, what would you say? Washington, D.C., right? If I were to ask you, what is the capital of Haiti? Port-au-Prince. What is the capital of Mexico? Mexico City. What's the capital of Canada? Ottawa. Ottawa. What's the capital of Norway? Norway. <laughs> Oslo. What is the capital of Jerusalem or of Israel? No. Other than the United States and nine other small countries, all the other countries of the world do not recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. They consider Tel Aviv the capital. The United Nations refuses to call Jerusalem the capital of Israel because they say that's got to be part of our two-state solution. That's why the world was angered when President Trump said, we're going to recognize Jerusalem as the capital and move the embassy there. People said, you're going to start wars. So again, other than the United States and nine pretty much small countries, everybody else in the world says Tel Aviv is the capital of Israel, not Jerusalem. It's a political football, Jerusalem. All right, so what do we do with this? My goodness, Jim, just got hit with a tidal wave. Here's what we do with this. When you see Jerusalem on the news, know that this city is a unique city in all the world. There is no other city like it. Three religions call it home. No other city like that in the world. That city is a stumbling block right now for the whole two-state solution thing. How are they going to figure that out? Jerusalem's at the center of that. I want you to understand, I'm just, like I said, I'm just trying to pull back the curtain. The majority of the world has no clue what's going on. I just want you to pull back the curtain and say, 
wow, there's a cosmic chess game going on right now. And ultimately, there's going to be one final battle in Jerusalem. One final battle. So how does this affect my life? Again, I would argue we are in the last of the last days. And here's what Jesus said. Be on your guard so that your minds are not dulled by carousing, drunkenness, and the worries of life, or that day when he returns will come on you suddenly like a trap, for it will come on all who live on the face of the earth. The vast majority of the world has no clue what's going on spiritually. They just don't understand it. Be alert at all times, praying that you may have the extreme to escape all these things that are going to take place and to stand before the Son of Man. My question to you is, are you ready for the return of Christ? As you watch the headlines, as you watch what's happening in Israel, understand there is a spiritual battle that's taking place. Because here, I'll just wrap up with this. In Satan's brain, or whatever he has, if he can control Jerusalem, he can stop the Messiah from returning. Because the Old Testament says the Messiah will rule from Jerusalem. He will set up his throne in Jerusalem. So Satan wants to do everything he can to keep the Messiah from coming back. And so he's going to do everything he can to block the rebuilding of that temple because the Jews want to build that. We know it's going to exist. He's doing everything he can to to turn the world against the Jews. Look at the rise of anti-Semitism. He's going to do everything he can to turn the United States against Israel. Uh, Israel's not perfect, and they're largely a secular country, but God still has a plan for that city. Satan's going to do everything he can to stop the Messiah from returning. And in his mind, if I can destroy Jerusalem, or I can keep the Jews from having control of Jerusalem, or I can can do anything to derail this plan, I'm going to do it. I just want you to watch the headlines. But most of all, I want you to be ready. Be ready. Are you living your life in such a way that when the Messiah returns, you're ready? Let's pray. Father, I know this was a lot of information, but I hope we just all understand the big point. Jerusalem is a city unlike any other in the world. And it's the big piece, a big piece in the cosmic chess game. And Satan wants to do everything he can to prevent the Messiah from returning. So, Father, as we go through our lives, may we not be unaware of what's happening, but have our eyes and ears open as we watch the headlines. Not so that we live in fear, but that we live in expectation, looking for our redemption. So, Father, I pray that we'll live our lives in such a way that we're ready when Christ returns. And Father, it seems like it may be sooner than later. So may we be ready, be on guard, be alert, and work, for the night is coming. And so Father, we pray all these things in the name of Christ. Amen.